Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the October third meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Thank you all for coming. We are shy of Julia tonight. She had a dog walking accident. Mm -hmm. So hopefully uh, she'll be fine two weeks from now when we meet again. Uh, tonight the entirety of our agenda is hearing from uh, five of the proposals. Uh, we're going to begin with Florence Fields, move on to the community gardens, and then end with the three proposals from the city planning, land acquisition, and accessibility uh, program, and a multi-use path. So we'll go in that in that order. As we always do when starting CPC meetings, we open up for general public comment. Is there anyone here that would like to speak? Not in regard to these five proposals, but just general comments. Okay, so let's get going, and we'll begin with uh, with Florence Fields. Uh, before Anne Marie comes up, let me just make a comment to all of you folks and everyone in general: is uh, is that while we uh, love the work that we do up here. It's it is difficult to uh, we're always faced with difficult decisions. In this round for the fall, we have a little bit shy of 1.6 million dollars in proposals in requests. Uh, we have for both the fall and the spring for the entire year somewhere around 800 thousand dollars to spend. So just be aware, folks who are coming to us with proposals that uh, our funding or not funding you is really a reflection of the amount of money that we have. So essentially, we have half the amount of money of the proposals for this round. Um, if we were to spend all the money, we would have no money for next round. So just bear with us and the difficult decisions that, that we have given our limited. Um, I believe Anne Marie, you're going to speak for the sure. fields. Thank you. Good evening. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Anne Marie Mogio. I am the director of the city's Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, I have a little PowerPoint to go through for Florence Fields. Feel free to uh, instruct me for any of it if uh, you have any questions. So let's see. Okay. So. Florence, Florence uh, Recreation Fields Park. Mm -hmm. It is in Florence at 145 Meadow Street. Um, this project started about 10 years ago or so with looking for new playing fields and, and finding this wonderful spot that includes now this park, the community gardens across the street with Grove Food Northampton runs, and then the Crimson Clover Farm um, above our recreation area there, um, the top there where community farms, all, all the plots are and things. Um, this map just shows you that this park is pretty much in the center of Northampton, um, which is in a really nice spot. It's We have um, been able to add bike paths throughout the city and different things, so it's very accessible and for people to get to, to walk and bike to. The park currently has five multi-purpose fields, which um, has tonight, it had probably four or five, six, soccer uh, teams on it running around in the springtime and in the fall there's lacrosse and um, it has two baseball fields a 90 foot which is teenager teenage older kids high school junior high school kids it has a 70 foot baseball field you'll see some pictures of those in a minute which is younger kids Oops. it has a building with um, restrooms really nice restrooms a storage area um, a future potential concession area for the teams to use and a picnic area. There is a three quarter of a mile walking path that goes around that is always full of dog walkers and, and people just taking strolls up through Florence and around there and parents at practices and things. So it is a um, hugely popular <coughs> area. This is some pictures of what has been developed down there so far. The two baseball fields. Um, this is some of the multi-purpose fields there and some of the views of them. It's also organically maintained by the uh, DPW's Parks and Cemetery Division. So it's all organic maintenance down there since we started. 
the play structure that is there. That's the um, first phase of the play structure. That's part one. You'll see um, you have pictures of part two also. Uh, that has a big area around it that we hope to add the rest of it and finalize the area. The path around the park has walkers, as I mentioned, joggers. It is a um, really nice piece of property to recreate on. Here is the bathroom concession building. It's actually two separate two separate buildings, you can kind of see in the right side picture there, with solar on it that runs all the electricity for the irrigation. The irrigation there is well, well water, um, so everything there is run on wells. The picnic tables up on the top were donated by the Ellerbrook, um, Ellerbrook Field Fund. Those were de donated at the end of this summer, so there's now picnic tables and seating areas there for people to sit and eat while they're at their games and practices. So this what we're on now is phase, I think I want to say phase six for this development down here, which we are hoping and it, this should be the final uh, phase of the project. Uh, we have been playing on it. People have been using it for about two years now that it's been having games on and practices and people walking. And through those two years, we've really realized certain things that are left that we really need there that we couldn't afford in the past. So we have applied, the whole budget is for $626,000. We've applied for the state park grant, which is a maximum of 400,000. Um, we hear about that in December. Uh, this uh, CPA request is for 100,000. And then the remaining 126,000, we will be planning on through donations, special events. We've already done some fundraising for it. So a part of that 126, we have some um, of that money already fundraised. And then we have a Friends of Parks and Recreation that is um, planning on doing some free fundraising for this too, if it's all, if all the grants come through. The plans you can't, and I can't see very well, you have it in your packet to these plans, but um, I'll start up in the top, the top right hand side, top, uh, no, top left hand side, shows you, that's the um, bigger baseball field. There's a uh, need for some additional safety netting on both, both fields. That go around, the, you can see the little curve of the red along the backstops and things. That's one thing that we've really realized since everyone's been playing there is that the safety netting needs to, there is some, but it needs to be extended and added in some areas so that balls don't go towards the playground, so they don't go into the parking lot, um, where sometimes you can't park in certain spots if there's games there because the fall balls are coming over. So some of those things uh, just weren't able to be paid for in the other when we, when we first built this, and it's something we've realized exactly where they have to go and um, where to put them. Also, the playground, like you saw that picture, just has that first phase of it. The rest of it um, would go in here along with some swings and there's the rest of it. So on the left-hand side, we have just that part where the slides are that's in. So this phase would add the rest of it for the kids. On the right-hand side is a play structure, which is a farm theme to fit in down there for younger children be smaller for like five five to twelve year olds. It would also add additional safety netting that I spoke about, solar powered scoreboards you hope to get, um, additional benches around as people are using the fields you, they are requesting more um, areas to sit when they walk around, more accessible um, areas to sit when they walk around the back to sit and relax, um, some more trees we plan on putting in and then those additional uh, some team dugout areas which provide shade in the summertime for teams and when it's raining. Um, so that is uh, it's all, all in your packet, all the different um, parts of that also. And those are all the different additions we hope to be putting in with this phase. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Anything? Anything? Uh, questions? <coughs> so you may have said this, but I've forgotten. Yep, that's okay. An application. Is the $100,000 a required match? We, it is, it will only be used if we get the park grant, but we, right. we have to match the 400 with the, two, the rest of the 226. So um, we have to come up with 226,000 more. Um, so. so it's, we're, if we're planning, we would, have to try to fundraise for it, I guess, if, if or, we, if we get it. Or scale back the scope of the project, is that possible? 
Um, you can do that, but the state grant is a certain percentage of what the project is, so then we would get less from the state if we scaled back the project. So mm -hmm. at 625, 626, it's whatever the match is, I want to say, what is that, 64% or something like that. They, they match a certain percentage of your entire project budget. So if we scale back, then they'll scale back what they give us. So then we still have to come up with you know, a bulk of money. <coughs> and so. is, is, are you required to complete it by a certain time? In other words, could you extend your fundraising over a several year period in order to come up with the funds? Um, the PARC grant has to be spent within the, the fiscal fiscal year that it's awarded so, so to, that would have to be mm -hmm. that would have to be spent funds within that time yes yes within the year mm -hmm. oh, thank you. <coughs> and that time is when the, the fiscal would be this fiscal year um be spent by then? they get well they announce in december so um usually the acquisition or any that kind of part is is the is would be for fy19 <coughs> so i this is for fy20 so it would start we would go be able to go out to bid and all those kinds of things and start doing that that kind of stuff with the money. Um, but then the project doesn't start until FY20, which is July. So it have to be completed by the June 30th, 2020. Yes. 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 Hi, Rick. Uh, Chris Allman, thanks for coming. Um, I'm not familiar with the, this granting process. Have you? Have you? Is this? Is Applying for these state grants, something you do on a regular basis. This how how confident are you? We take turns. Uh, Wayne and I and um, like Plasky Park. It depends on what the projects are in the city. So the city has been um, very successful in getting them. Um, sometimes um, sometimes they're. I think we've gotten it. Look Park went for the, the park grant and was denied a couple, within the past few years. I, I can't remember what year. Wayne will know exactly. <laughs> but um, Blasky Park was what was in turn for it for the past couple of years. So um, now and then this, this round was our turn to, for this park. Okay. So we're, we're usually fairly good with our score. I mean, we're really good with our score because yeah. we have really good sustainable practices. So, so that grant we score high. The grant can go private park also? Um, I don't think so. Is that why local park didn't get it? Or? No, no, because they're city-owned property. Okay. So, um, no, they were going, I want to say it was, I don't remember what they went for with it. Going back to the timing, though, so. can you help us understand, so at what point do you have to show the grant, the grantors that you have? The oh, that we have it? Um, I believe when it's awarded in December, we have to show that we have the, the, the max, the I believe. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look on that. Could you check uh, on that? Yeah, I will. Actually, when Wayne comes in, I'll ask him because he, he memorizes these things a lot. Yeah, you they have demonstrated it already that with bonding authority. That oh, that's right. We did. We did. That's right. With the city council. Yeah. The city council voted it with the bounded yes. What does that mean? So we, um, when the city applies for grants, one way to demonstrate the match without without actually having it in hand is to show that the city council has approved the bonding authority for it, but that would not be executed. Um, if were the, that actually needed, the city council likely would not approve it. Right. right. <laughs> they do that for like many, right? For many? Yeah, I mean, it's basically to, to create additional time for the, the city to show up the required But, but that yeah. said, yeah. if that's true though, you could still get the grant without this money and then you, you just need the money to pay the contractor at some point. Is that right? Uh, you would need it in hand before entering the contract with the state. Before it's signed. Before yeah. the grant? Yeah. yeah. How much private money has been raised so far? Um, I would say there's about, let's see, probably around 45 to 50. Yeah. Uh, the 120 yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, the 50, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to add up the different ones in my head. Okay, so I must have added it up in there. Yes. Yeah. Sarah, the grant yeah. contract yeah. that would be, that's the contract that would be in June next year? I'm not sure when we have to sign so it. So that, it would probably come in in January, February, depending on the timing of the grant yeah. announcement. Um, and we would, so the city would need to show the matching funds in hand before going out to bid for anything. If the park grant did not come in, we would not give a 
100,000, correct? Right. So right. nothing would be done. Right, we would, yeah, try something else in the future, right. So going back to something that was hinted upon earlier, um, if you don't get the full amount or don't get any of it, Mm -hmm. Is there a contingency plan? I mean, you have to scale back the whole project, so where would you look? At what part of it would you? If we didn't get the park the, grant, I think. No, no, if you didn't get the CPA money, oh, CPA. and you'd have to scale back the park grant because it's a smaller percentage of the overall project. Right, right. right. So which parts would you? Which parts of, the, of this? <coughs> um, you know, I don't know if I could say off the top of my head. You'd have to really take a look at it and say, okay, because some of the things if you don't do them, then, you know, the, the big, Cost in this budget is um, the handicap accessibility of, of the playground structure area, one of the newer um, requirements or things that the state's asking people to do is a poured in place uh, buffer. So that's a pretty high cost in so this the budget, playground for the playground areas. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're still, it's a new regulation, so we're still kind of learning what that means and how much, but that's um, a good chunk. And the safety netting is a big chunk. Um, of, of the project, so um, you know, those are a couple things. So that you don't have a priority list at this point. No, but, but no. I, I would want to talk to all the users and see, kind of like, all right, this is the, this is what, you know, how much do we have to cut? Well, what, what do you guys, what do you think we could go without, if anything? So, how did you come up with this list? From all the different. The, the leagues that play there. I mean, all the components that were that are left. Pretty much from the overall when we started out with our big master plan for here, um, it was all these things were part of it, just not things that we could afford as we moved along. Um, and then some of the things were, as I said, we realized as you're playing there, like wow, these balls are going over towards the playground, which you know now things have changed with the different um, bats and balls that the kids are using and they're going further so now it's like oh we really need some safety netting up um in that section so things like that some things like um scoreboards and and um, dugouts and more benches I mean, those are things we always knew that we wanted down there um but the safety netting is probably one part of it and where the balls come into the parking lot sometimes you can't really you don't really plan for that until it starts happening you realize where some some areas are that need to be attended to. So, what about the playground? How do you quantify that you don't have enough playground and that's enough playground? That because there's a lot of that's you know, more than a it, third of your budget. The space that's there, it was built for for this basically. So when we started out with the master plan, there's already all the groundwork is done there and it's all um, laid out where <coughs> so where the one little piece is. It's like this little great little piece like a tree house and then there's all this just space of nothing that's already all cut out and stuff so we planned to fill that all when okay, we started with the master plan how do you know you like how do you know that that's the like just because there's a space for it doesn't mean you need it I mean, oh because there's kids there there's people there all the time i mean it's it's packed down here okay. at this place um so and it's something that people have you know since the rest of it coming and for toddlers and younger kids mm -hmm. uh, is the swing the slides that are there are pretty high up you know they're still kids can do it but the um, parents and grandparents are always walking down there and walking around during games and looking for siblings more things kids play mm -hmm. absolutely yeah families are parents are walking the kids are riding bikes around I mean it to, to be honest this this project is um been way more than we could have ever expected when we started for how popular it is and and how many people um, utilize it and all the, all the different comments and, and people can't even believe that it's you know, came to fruition to be what it is. So it's such a, it's a gem down there, so. Oh, and when I look at the budget, there's that 15% contingency, mm -hmm. which in this case is 72,000. If that contingency, if you're awarded full funding for whatever a miraculous reason, there is that contingency is unnecessary, mm -hmm. who, who gets that money back? Because does the state, do you reduce the, I think we spend the state grant, and then I don't know if we ever not spend the contingency. It's not um, happening. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a nice thought, but I don't. I don't think there's ever been a project where we haven't spent it or most of, you know, most of it, because things of that 
that project was um, what? That was the the cost there was last. What's the date on that? Um, July, September, February, uh, July. Yeah, it was well, updated. Updated in July. Yeah. So. Uh, do you have, does it, you have no. contract documents? Or not yet. No. So that's including a design contingency. Yeah, they. I mean, they they have the master like that um, form with all the bed and thing purchase. I mean, they furniture design who we're who's doing who we've been working with for this. They are the ones who designed and did this whole plant, did the whole part. Mm -hmm. So they know this place to a T. So. So are they going to be producing contract documents? Or? Oh yes, yes, yep. We already have a contract with them. To do that for whenever that time comes. Are you giving a third party estimate? Because so. you can run into trouble when you have your designers giving your estimate. Um, I mean, it's in their interest to make this project seem like it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we have done that. I mean, what if the contracts all, I mean, bids could all come back twice what your designers are telling you. Yeah. It's going to cost. Well, let's hope not. I don't know. I don't know. So that's why people do third party estimates. Yeah. Well. I don't know, I and mean, we, we have. The state doesn't ask for that? I'd be surprised the state would uh, ask for that. So you don't have to go out to bid? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Even, we though, went out to bid. even though you went out to bid for the. So we have the, the Berkshire's hired to do the um, overall, the, they'll be doing the bid and the, and the bid, the bid process, and they'll be overseeing any construction that happens. So they're already under contract for that. So you don't go with the same contract so. that did the initial project? Nope, they have to go out to bid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They have to. Mm -hmm. initial, the initial people were from way out east, I think, too. So. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. If you have anything else, just feel thank free you. to email me. Thank you so much. Right, Sarah, we're going to try to put in another. And I think, Anne Marie, as you know, our public comment is uh, what is the date for for that? That is the uh, October, uh, I think November 7th, or is it October 17th? So the next meeting, Sarah? Uh, no, the next meeting is more meetings we have. So we uh, November the 7th. Okay. We'll be open to public comment. All right, so next up is, I think we have a couple folks. Also with Parks and Recreation, but talking about the Community Garden Project. <coughs> I know, it's shocking. It doesn't like my computer. Really? It's still not connected. There we go. So, Thanks. I'm Larry Cochran from the Northampton Community Garden on Birch Pit Road. I co-direct the garden with um, this team. We actually have a dozen people. Um, Brian is one of them. Betsy Wolfson and I co-direct. Um, the garden is managed by um, 12 volunteers who are also gardeners but are on the garden committee. So Tom Gagnon, um, Linda and Blaze Bazalian also serve. So if you have questions, feel free to ask to ask all of us. Um, in the packet uh, and in the application, I gave you the an overview of Japanese knotweed, a little bit of an overview of the garden. Um, also gave you aerial views and um, outlined the place that where where knotweed is growing, and we <coughs> would like to have this grant to hire people come in to come in and remove that knotweed. Um, people get confused about the two community gardens in Northampton. Um, this community garden on Birds Pit Road, where um, Prince Street runs into it, is about seven and a half acres. As far as we know, it's the oldest and largest community gardens in Western Mass. 
it was originally the kitchen garden for the Northampton State Hospital. Um, there are currently approximately 415 garden plots, each roughly 20 by 20. The garden in its form has been here for about 40 years, so some of the lines aren't exactly straight anymore, um, but, but the entire um, acreage is still there. Um, this year we have about 260 gardeners, most of whom live in Northampton, but in the application I gave you the broader range, we have people in there from Greenfield down to, down to Longmeadow. Um, it's really a wonderful place, and because it's been around so long, people really sort of buy to get in here. Um, currently, gardeners pay between $20 and $25 for their plots. And in addition to that, they're responsible for contributing two hours of community service for their first plot and an hour for additional plots. Um, scholarships are available for anyone who's unable to pay the full amount. Um, last year, we gave back, um, Anne Marie, we were going over numbers yesterday, about $1,600. Um, in scholarships mm -hmm. and um, different kinds of credits that people get for living in Northampton, for having a compost, a smaller compost pot. Um, this community garden is part of Northampton Parks and Recreation. Um, and I mentioned the community service hours. Um, in addition to what the garden committee does, we create the um, sort of the mechanics of the garden. And so when gardeners volunteer, they mow, they prune, they help keep it weeded. We have a tool shed, um, so they manage the tool shed, carts, keep, it, keep the equipment operational. Um, they keep, we have two compost piles, a small one and a large one, which is the one we're talking about tonight. Um, they keep the compost piles um, cooking um, to try to keep the heat to um, break down everything that we put in there. Um, and something big for us is keeping water going, keeping spigots and hoses going. We publish a seasonal garden newsletter. Initially, we've also added um, a monthly, or sometimes bi-monthly or bi-weekly email on the city's constant contact platform. Um, we work, as I said, really closely with Anne Marie and with everyone in the, the office at the rec department. Um, all our applications are processed there. Um, and it's the go-to place for gardeners who have questions. Um, one of the things that's unique about this garden is the, um, just the variety of the people who were there. And I mentioned that in the application. We have individuals, we have um, single parents, we have people who are new to the United States, we have people who have been here for a long time. We have a number of people, I think we had 41 people this season who qualified or who um, took benefit of the um, over 65 or older, you get your first plot for free. Um, so we have a lot of seniors uh, with us in the garden. Um, we have people who um, we found out we didn't know uh, until last year. Um, we have people, there's an assisted living facility at Village Hill and at Christopher Heights, and so we have people from there coming over. So we have very natural overlap with, with Village Hill. Um, we also have people who are in walkers and are physically challenged and a number of, of folks with developmental and, and mental health challenges as well. Um, these are some of the people who are in the garden. Um, it's always a vibrant place, um, always a lot going on. These are people who garden there. Um, we got permission um, to build picnic tables. We started something this year. Um, after the gardeners fought to save a mulberry tree that the DPW was hoping they could chop down to more easily access the old compost pile. And so that tree has become, the old compost pile has become a sitting area. And we started something called the Under the Mulberry Tree Speaker Series this year. So we're teaching things like um, cover cropping and gardening and pollinator habitat design and soil science. Um, so it's been a it's, it's been a fun process. Um, most of our gardeners grow food for themselves and their families. Um, probably 75% uh, of the gardener people growing food for themselves. Some mix um, vegetables, fruits, herbs, flowers. We also have people, um, the master gardeners, for example, have four plots and raised beds. 
that we use as demonstration plots and all the produce that's grown there is donated to the survival center in Northampton. Um, we have pollinator friendly gardens and habitats. Um, we also have Tree Northampton there. They have four plots and so they plant small whips uh, and let them grow and then once those trees reach a certain height, they're planted throughout the city for free. And this, these are just more shots of, of the garden just to give you an idea of what's planted there and who's there and, and the variety of people that we have. Um, the garden is also host, because it's public property, it's city property, numerous workshops, classes, and events, um, including our own Under the Mulberry Tree Speaker Series. Um, this year we also did a clean plant sale in early June, and we brought in um, small growers, farmers, and nurseries from around the area of Worthington, Compton, um, East Hampton, Hadley, um, small local farmers who are growing plants which have not been treated with neonicotinoids or other pesticides. We're not an organic community garden and in actuality community gardens cannot achieve um, uh, organic delineation just because they're community gardens, but we encourage our gardeners not to use pesticides or at least to know, or herbicides, or at least to know um, how to apply them at the best times and in the best way. The master gardeners are really helpful in training on things like integrated pest management and, and teach that as well. Um, there are outside groups that come in too, again, because it's city property. So Butterfly Walks um, by um, Tom Ganyon, who's on our committee, but also is part of the uh, Massachusetts Butterfly Association. Um, Lori Sanders and Fred do um, walks, um, whether bees or nature walks through the garden as part of historic Northampton. Um, and the master gardeners have done soil testing, fall cleanup, habitat design, um, cover cropping, um, as I said before. So if it's, there's always someone in the garden and there's always someone, um, something available to the gardeners who are there. And again, um, just more shots of, of different events, our plant sale, um, Western Mass Pollinator Network, um, gardens in winter, there are always are people there. Um, so that's the background on the garden. The project, this project that we're requesting funds for is for the removal of an area of Japanese knotweed that runs along the northern border of the garden. Um, it is adjacent to the border with Village Hill and it actually goes down the hill in the woods and then there's farmland at the bottom of that. Um, Japanese knotweed, I gave you the background of the, of the plant in the proposal, um, but basically it's a, once again, it's another instance that a plant from Asia was brought into actually the UK first by a horticultural society because they thought it was a pretty plant and thought it made a great addition to people's gardens. And like the chestnut tree blight, um, within about um, three years, it was growing uncontrollably. Still, it was brought into the United States and sold um, and actually in Namkeg, the garden that's, the um, property that's in West Stockbridge has knotweed and they argue that they should keep it because it's historically significant and it was part of the garden in the early 1900s. So they actually are growing Japanese knotweed there. It's a really beautiful plant. Um, you can see the left hand picture, if you can see it, honeybees and, and different bees. Um, go to it for nectar. It doesn't need to pollinate itself, so it doesn't produce pollen. Um, but uh, beekeepers are actually loving knotweed, and there are some medicinal uses for it. The problem still is maintaining it because it has no natural enemies here. Um, before we even knew about CPC grants, we were faced with a row along the northern edge, the northern road, next to where our large compost pile is, a Japanese knotweed that got about six feet tall every summer. Um, we were, uh, we made it one of the jobs for community service jobs to get in there with, with machetes and weed whackers and, and different um, cutting tools. And so we made it people's jobs, people signed up to cut the knotweed back. Um, we did that last year 
unsuccessfully because it grows so quickly. It's, it's um, I think it can grow four feet in a month, if not more. Um, this year we worked with DPW with Bill Sullivan. His guys were great bringing up a brush hog and they go through and cut it um, about once every two to three weeks. And in the period in between, um, it pops right back up again and is in a two to three foot, gets to two or three feet tall. Um, supposedly cutting it that way begins to cut back on the nutrients because it can't photosynthesize. But still, what we have found is that that controls some of it, but then it's been going down and over the hill and heading north and into our compost pile. Um, Japanese knotweed mostly propagates itself, although it produces seeds that you saw before, um, mostly propagates itself through rhizomes, and those rhizomes can run up to about 80 feet. Our driveway that goes along the northern border of the garden is about 20 feet wide, and we've already been finding it coming up from underneath the, that driveway and into the gardens on the other side. Um, so we've, we've done our best to try to control it, and we've worked with the city to try to control it, and we are concerned now that it's moving on into gardens on the other side of the driveway, and it's moving into the only real area we have that can hold a compost pile that is as large as the three-part compost pile that we have. Um, in the upper right-hand corner is not, we, this is, that was from last year. Um, Bill's guys came in and literally took it down to the ground. Um, and that lasted for about three weeks and everything was back up again. When it pops up, it almost looks like asparagus and grows incredibly quickly. The middle picture on the top, it's a little bit dark on the screen, but that's where the, our large compost pile is, which abuts the, the Village Hill property. You can see the piles of compost there. It's not the compost when things are first dumped on it that's problematic, it's that phase two gets picked up and dumped over to the left, and that's where not really is infiltrating the, the ground that's underneath it. And the bottom pictures are the north road um, heading uh, northeast, and you can see the knotweed, how quickly it's grown, and how much of that area it covers. And the picture on the far right on the bottom is knotweed down the hill and, and coming around behind the compost. So our objectives for the grant are um, to restore the area within the garden's <laughs> boundaries by removing the knotweed reseeding the area once it's done, once the knotweed has been knocked back with native plants and allowing the area to revert back um, to those, its, its own native populations of plant and animal life. It's interesting to me that everything I read about knotweed, and I've read a lot, says that it doesn't usually pop up in woodland areas, and, that, and yet we're finding that the woods on the edge of the garden and down in the hill um, is filled with knotweed, and I'm not really sure why. It may be that the forest is younger, and so when enough light gets in, it may be the moisture content, I'm not sure, but we absolutely have knotweed through the woods. Um, so we want to restore that era. We want to work to prevent the knotweed's further spread into the nearby garden plots and the backyards, trying to be good neighbors, and the adjoining farmland, again, um, by trying to be good neighbors. Um, the biggest thing, though, is, and the thing that has the most impact on everybody is the compost area, because everybody use that, uses that compost. When people clean out their gardens, um, the majority of the garden uses the large northern compost. And so if there are, once uh, there are pieces of rhizome get in there, or secondarily seeds, then our compost never gets hot enough to really kill the seed or the root. Um, and it can be, can't be microscopic, but it can be really little. It doesn't take much for it to be in good dirt with soil and sunlight, and it will pop up wherever it's planted. And in that case, it will be somebody's garden. And once that happens, our concern is that it's off and running. Um, Brian actually did sits on our committee and did some research for vendors who have worked um, within the city or with, within the area and within the city um, taking care of and uh, remediating um, knotweed. Um, Land Stewardship Inc. Was, was someone in Turner's Falls who he found, talked with, um, and was pleased with. I actually talked 
with UMass and a couple of other people. None of us on the committee are fans of glyphosate in any way, shape, or form. Um, new research coming out about it is kind of scary. And yet, everyone I talked to said that glyphosate is the only way um, to get rid of knotweed. Um, that you can't dig it up, you can't cut it down, you can't get rid of the soil enough, oops, soil enough to get rid of it. Um, their, their proposal was included in the packet that you received, but basically they would recommend a five-year program. Um, you can never totally eradicate the knotweed, but they're looking at 90% control um, starting. They were hoping to start in 2019. If we had the grant, we would start it in the spring of 2019 and would do it for the next five years. Their explanation of it would be that it would never be wiped out totally, but the size of it would be much smaller and it would almost be dwarf-like in size, and it would prevent the, the spread of it. Um, there was a comment in their, um, in their proposal that I think it was a $3,000 cost to have someone come in once the first round of injection of glyphosate and the foliar application were done. And so there would be a lot of dead stalks. Their comment to us was that um, anecdotally we could save that money if we had either the DPW or gardeners go in and pick up the stalks and get rid of them. I talked with Anne Marie, talked with Bill Sullivan, and I know for our gardeners, I think it's not safe to ask people who don't know what they're doing to pick up a bunch of plants that have been impregnated with glyphosate. Likewise, DPW does a lot of stuff for us. We also know they're pressed for time and staff, and so I'm not even sure where we would, we would put those, but we stepped away from that as even being an option, that if we had to pay the $3,000 and if we could get the money, it made sense for us to do that. Um, so that's why we didn't we didn't say oh we can go in and pick up the, the knotweed. Um, as the project moves forward, the garden committee. Most of us have been gardening at the at the gardens for many many years. Um, the committee sometimes um, there are people that come and go on the committee because people move or, or people um, people's schedules change. But our commitment to this project is among all of us. The core group of us will be here. And even if some people come and go, the core group of us will have agreed to oversee this project all the way through. The five years doesn't, doesn't really seem like it's that long to us. Um, we'll appoint, if we get the grant and if we um, bring in um, this group, we'll appoint a member to act as a liaison with the contractor. Um, and that person will report back both to, to the committee. We'll also have somebody report back to um, Parks and Recreation and also to the DPW. So we'll all work together to monitor the vendor and, and what's happening. Um, thank you for your time. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Larry. <coughs> questions? <coughs> uh, I thought that the, um, it was uh, the proposal from the stewardship was very clear, so that was very helpful. And I wondered if um, they had um, given you examples of other sites that they had worked on where they had seen this happen successfully. They did, and we looked at them and called and talked to people. Um, and they were, everybody understands that it's hard to wipe out 100%. But um, everybody that we talked to was happy with their professionalism, with their timeliness, with their communication, and with the results that they had. And were they also using the same oats to um, seed with? Or they, were they using the mix? Or everybody's mix? different, um, and it depends what the land is, where they put right. that in. There actually might be a way that we can reduce some of that cost. There wasn't time to really go over exactly what they would plant there. I know that's a chunk of it, but I, there are things like Asclepias tuberosa in there, which I think added $240. We don't absolutely need that there. I mean, I think we can break that down a little bit, but that would be almost a phase two anyway. The first part is getting in there and um, getting the knotweed out and then seeing what would normally grow in that area. Because I, I noticed that art in the article um, that was included, they yep. mentioned kind of, kind of an elaborate mix that they were using in the one demonstration. Yeah. 
it was a riparian environment? Well, it changes, it depends, because knotweed can grow in a lot of different places. It generally grows in places that where water is present or, you know, more moist. You'll see it all along the Mill River, for example. Right. This is on the edge of a hill, and yeah. so it's, and it grows down in the woods, so it's a really different place. So I, the seed that you would plant after it was knocked down along the river is different than you would plant along the edge of our road. So the, so the idea is to try to, so you're not going to try to knock out the entire colony, but just the area that is basically adjacent to the road. Yeah. So is there concern that the colony below is going to continue to push forward? There always is. Yeah. But if we can create almost like a fire break when, you, when you're doing a fire, you know, we may not be able to prevent it from going downhill and into the field, but at least we can print. This covers, I think it's, um, uh, I forget how many square feet it is, um, but it covers the side of the hill, not all the way down, and around the area that I think I said in the proposal flanks the, the compost area. Okay. And then just one other question. I know there's a big problem with garlic mustard up on the state hospital site, or the, well, the dog park, I guess. Yep. Um, is that an issue for you as well? I wonder if there are other invasives that, you know, could be knocked out at the same time. I personally look at invasives in, in, in a different way. You know, there are native wildflowers, wildflowers, invasives. Um, my friends in Norway laugh when we talk about garlic mustard because they put it in salad. So there's a perception about it, about different wildflowers, about whether they're good or not, or whether they're harmful or not. In theory, garlic mustard can emulate a flower that can um, trick monarchs into thinking it's a good place to lay its eggs, and in fact, it's not a good place. So whether there's an infestation, I really want to look at it. The thing with knotweed is it doesn't need anybody to, pop, to pollinate it. It propagates itself. It has no natural enemies. And around the world, other than Japan, Korea, and China, knotweed is a problem. It's a problem all over Europe. It's a problem all over the United States. And it, because of its height, and because it, it's um, it's really vibrant, I mean, it's just this. For me, it, it's if there is evidence of aliens on the planet, it's Japanese mountain. Garlic mustard is easier to manage. We have garlic mustard at the garden. We just pay. We have people as part of their community service hours. It's on our list to just go pull it. Yeah, it's a lot easier. That's true. But you can't really do that with not weed. Yeah, it's really a beast. The application presented LSI as the chosen vendor, but because this is city funds being spent on city property, you would be required to get votes okay. for that. Okay. Um, so just to let you know about that. And okay. Do you anticipate that this would be a contract with the DPW or with the parks? And I honestly or? don't know. What do you think? It'd probably be a combination. I'm not sure we would work with DPW to see, because they do all the maintenance. We do all the programming, and they do all the maintenance. So we, we sort of split things sometimes. Okay. Yes. Who so does what? So this would actually go through all the regular city property. Yeah. Because the garden is city property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Because of the, the size and the scope of, you know, five-year plan, I'm interested why you didn't come as a small grant proposal for the first year and then return with a more specific plan for the following <coughs> years. Because we have a, a small grant program that's three thousand dollar which was given our the uh, amount of funds we have to spend and the pressures from other proposals Absolutely. it might be a better way to Sarah to asked that and and at least the way she asked it my understanding of it was that we really do know it has to be a multi-year program it would be a waste of money to do it for one year and not have somebody follow up. And so if we got a $3,000 grant and then the next year we didn't and we didn't have a way to deal with it, it would almost be worse than not doing anything at all. And so that's why we were trying to say this is a multi-year program to treat it, to really get it out. I understand that, but yeah. I'm not sure. I, I don't want to throw good money after bad. Your rides might be better with yeah. the coming every year with a $3,000 okay. pass. Okay given the strain we're under every cycle. They need sixty five hundred dollars in year one it looks like. Year one is the is the biggest chunk. Right. Yeah. And it, and it was more than three thousand dollars. Was that an option then? To fund them for six thousand dollars this year? I don't know. 
it could be. That's something to talk about. Other questions? I mean, do you pay the contractors you, but year by year? You don't pay them all up front. Correct. Correct. But to know that we would need to do that, um, you know, everyone, I, I do a regular season opener with that UMass does talking about tree diseases and, and whatever is on the horizon, whatever's coming up, and not we always comes up, and it's always a multi-year plan, at least a five-year plan. Should be Thank you. Other questions for Larry? We good? We're good. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Okay, <clears throat> next up is the three proposals uh, coming from the Office of Planning and Sustainability, uh, the Parsons Brook Pine Barrens Acquisition, the Birds Falls Multi-Use Trail Creation, and the uh, Conservation Park Accessibility Improvements. Um, Wayne, I don't know if there's an order uh, that I uh, just want to go for it. Sure, I have no slides, so I'll do the order in your agenda if that works here. Uh, how would you want to do it? Okay, so first one is the Parsons Brook Pine Barren uh, purchase. This is usually we're buying the majority of our land on the edge of town, um, but this is a really exciting um, ecological area. It'd be the first Pine Barren we've ever purchased, the only Pine Barren in Northampton, which makes it the first one we purchased. Um, the only other Pine Barren I know in the area is the one up in Montague Plains. Um, so it's, this is an area where Parsons Brook runs through the property. We protect a lot of the headwaters of Parsons Brook in the Mineral Hills. We protect a lot of lower Parsons Brook in, in Parsons Brook Greenway. This would be a major part of the gap in between. Um, if we currently have 88 acres under auction, so agree to sell us that, and we're negotiating for an additional 30 acres, which we're fairly confident we're going to get. So we have a sort of a you know, definite 80 acres, and we think 120 acre patch right now. Um, so the brook itself, Parsons Brook, is really rich. People have fish there, and there's beaver activity. There's actually a great blue heron uh, a rookery there. Um, so the brook is a wonderful for resource. And then there's a sandy knoll, portion of which was the gravel. This is the, the Bill Will gravel that they're eating away at this. Um, but most of the area is this pine barren, sort of, uh, you know, a mature forest that lived in basically a fire ecology. It used to burn regulars, the trees. You know, there are trees that receive could supply fires and three stocks. Again, it's the, the only thing that in that area. Um, we already own conservation land to the east of this property, so we're connecting to that. And then, as I say, up and down the brook itself, we own other parcels of it as well. <coughs> we typically do a lot of small acquisitions each year and one big marquee acquisition. And this is by far our most important acquisition this year. Um, one thing you're going to see is a little bit different this year, and it's going on. I think the last time I was here, I may have talked about sort of our new relationship with Kestrel. But I just want to talk about it briefly so you know how it affects us. We, as you know, we need to put a conservation restriction on the property to purchase the CPA funds. We were doing this sort of on a transactional arrangement. So we pay them for the conservation restriction. So we were doing fundraising, we were, we were using CPA money to pay them to hold the conservation district. It's a significant cost, and it's, I love the CPA, but it's just it's a cost of CPA. <coughs> We've now reached a five-year arrangement with them where we're no longer responsible for paying them for the CRs. They're, they're gonna find the money for that themselves, but in return, we've agreed not to do fundraising campaigns. So we're giving up some potential funds and basically receiving that territory from them. So we have a list, frankly, of people who've donated to us for a number of years, and that, our agreement with them says that list we're allowed to keep. We will continue to fundraise for those people, sort of existing support, and everybody else, new people, small donations, there we go. So it means we have less fundraising capacity, which makes me a little bit nervous, but it's taken away what was a couple hundred thousand dollar commitment from us. So, you know, what we predicted over these five years would have been a couple hundred thousand dollar commitment. So we're giving up fundraising for, for small and medium sized donors, keeping fundraising for large donors or repeat donors, and getting out of having to do it. So overall, I think it's a good deal, but just it makes the structure of this a little bit different. Questions? 
questions for Wayne about this parcel? Uh, Wayne, in the sort of speak to its um, potential for development if, in fact, the land is not acquired. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. So, the, in theory, this would be an easy property to develop with a lot of homes. Um, well, it's not, not, you know, the Parsons Brook itself, the brook and the wetlands and the buffer wouldn't be developable, but the pine <coughs> barren would be developable. The reason I say in theory is it's just sort of a market reality. We don't allow dead end streets for more than 500 feet, and the cost of roads are so much, we're just not getting subdivisions. You know, we, we get people carving off a few prime homes. So I could draw you a, a, a map that would show about 40 homes on this property, which would be legal, but I don't want to alarm you. I don't believe that's what the market would do. I think what the market would do would probably be build a road from um, Cardinal Way to Sovereign Way and build maybe five to 10 homes off of it. Um, but it would still be a really bad pattern there. The other, our biggest fear, and again, right now this is not where the market is, but is someone extracting gravel. So the history of this property is I had funding from city council and other sources about 15 years ago. I've been here a long time. And this property was on the market in bankruptcy. And we went to bankruptcy court and bid on a property. Bill Willard, Inc. outbid us because they saw this property that's valuable for sand and gravel. It has sand and gravel deposits. They're selling their property. They're getting out of the sand and gravel business. So again, I, I wouldn't want to do a false alarm. There's nobody right now, as of tomorrow, who wants to do sand and gravel. They're going to try to sell it at a higher price than they've never taken. So again, no one today, but sand and gravel deposits are getting rarer and rarer. And I think it's, it's realistic to think that in some time in the future, someone would come back and revisit it. Um, again, my summary is I, the most likely scenario is a few homes that would still be pretty bad from an ecological standpoint. Questions? I, I will add, just given how rare these pine barrens are, the National Heritage Program, which is the state's program that deals with endangered species, is extremely excited. They don't usually get so involved. You know, we always ask them, we're applying for grants to write letters of support. And usually they say, yeah, we, you know, we like open space everywhere. This one clearly got them far more excited given the, the rarity they have at that time. So we would expect them to be a partner in future management interventions. If, um, if the public wanted to access this natural area, where, where would be the access point that the most likely, you know, if they were? So for not, people not fishing, people want to walk the existing conservation area on Parsons Brook, I mean on, on Cardinal Way, we call Parsons Brook Greenway. We actually cut a trail on our property right to the boundaries. We want to make it easier, frankly, for us to scout it. So there's, a, there's a, a wonderful trail that goes from Cardinal Way into the inner property. And I can't get permission, but it's full of old gravel roads. So it's pretty easy to, to go around the site. For fishermen, um, it, where the part where negotiate the extra land, you give us some access off of Ryan Road, and fishermen want to go um, straight to the to the, the pond that's made in Parsons Brook and Parsons Brook itself. So they would come from either Cardinal Way just off of Ryan Road or from way over by the Bill Willard ground. Excuse me, have you submitted a land grant for We them? have. So that's gone in? That's gone in. We, you know, we never know an election year. Uh, you know, they used to always announce in October, early November. The last couple of years have been later, but we're going to know by the end of the year, either just before you have to make a decision or just after. And what is the uh, expected match for that? So the grant is for 120000 is that correct? Um, the grant is for 60% uh, of 200000 so yes. <laughs> Sorry, not 64%. Um, do they require a match for the rest? They require a match for the rest, right. Um, and this is, as I say, this is our really important acquisition for us, so we're still trying to make this one happen even if we didn't get the state grant. So you notice in your budget, we're asking for money that would allow some land management. If the state grant came through in the budget, you'd see how much money we would use the CPA for the acquisition and how much we would use for management. If you funded us, and if the state didn't fund us, then we would want to flex that $40,000 from management to land acquisition. Because management can wait, but land acquisition obviously can't wait. Uh, I'm 
Also, a question on the budget. Um, under the um, the item recording fee survey title to the um, this is the collaboration. Um, we funded the is a conservation fund. Um, is that right, Sarah? Um, for this purpose, I thought, and I wondered if money would be taken out of that. To pay for so that the funds that we have left are totally committed. So the portion is coming from it. So obviously you wouldn't vote on this for some time period. We have a hazardous waste investigation going on right now. We are picking up five junk cars that are there to make sure there's no contaminated material. So those funds, which are not in the budget, we would be spending from that. But we have some other, you know, I say we do one big marquee acquisition and a lot of smaller acquisitions. So those funds are all committed for the 20 for here and for the smaller acquisitions this year. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Wayne. Okay. Moving on. So the next one is, and again, that last one we're talking about, we want to do anyway. We get the state grant or not because the land disappears. The next two projects, <coughs> we're looking for matching funds for grants that we've also applied for. If those grants came through, these other ones we wouldn't ask to go forward on. So we're asking for money as a match because obviously we're trying to leverage your money to go a lot further. So the first is a grant, and I don't really know what our chance of getting it is. We, you know, I think I talked to you a little bit about the new open space and recreation plan. We just adopted a seven-year plan. One of the goals of the new plan is to step up our efforts for both recreation areas and conservation areas um, to make them more handicap accessible. In some cases, that means bring us up to ADA standards. In some cases, which were illegal because we're grandfathered, but we want to comply as if we weren't grandfathered. And in some cases, it might actually be beyond ADA standards. You know. I use my 93-year-old mother as an example. She's not in a wheelchair, but she can't walk more than 100 feet. That's flat. You know, and so we're trying to serve other populations besides people who are formally uh, have disabilities. Um, so we applied for a $250,000 grant that would let us address a lot of deficiencies in recreation areas, bike path, which is sort of recreation, um, and conservation area, mostly bike path and recreation conservation areas. Are you know, less tough, so we don't have as much there. Um, it's really hard to judge our chance in the grant. We think we have an amazingly good application, but last year they gave out a million dollars, and we got two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So we got twenty-five percent of the entire state. All the work that we did around city hall was last year. The application form, so the formal scoring process, has nothing about previous grants. So on one hand, maybe they're going to do us on our merits, but it's hard to imagine that we got. 25% of last year's total, they're not going to hold it against it. So I, I just don't know the answer. I know that besides us being good grant writers, last year got funded because they didn't announce it very well. People didn't know about it. This year, everyone knows about it. So more How much was it last year? $250,000. Um, and then we have a match as well. So there's no, this grant doesn't formally have a match, but some design costs aren't eligible, and frankly, it's just not enough money to do what you want. But more importantly, the scoring is on voluntarily matching things. So in our application, we said we would provide a 20% match, which makes it more likely to get funded, but of course creates a burden for ourselves. And that's about what we did last year. That's what we chose 20%. That's frankly what we did last year because we had it and it seemed to help for us. Um, uh, you know, we don't have exact budgets because you never know these things. Do you go to bid one of the questions people ask is about concrete versus asphalt? That's partially a bidding answer. So when we did the, the, the new bike share stations in town, we found some of the bike share stations actually came in less of concrete than asphalt. Um, and when DPW did the sidewalks on North Street, concrete, they, they also bid it both ways, and concrete was more expensive and not that much more. So concrete is generally a much more expensive material. But sometimes in small areas where so much labor is involved, you know, if you're doing the labor, the, the actual amount of concrete you're using isn't that much. Um, so we like concrete when we can, but we, we have flexibility there. Um, we did hire a turtle consultant, for lack of better. Um, I'm sure it's a more formal title for, for what he does. Um, who helped us early on in the process, not specifically for this application, but we're very aware of turtle habitat. We want to design this around. Um, I know that 
from past conversations, even though you obviously are following CPA criteria. I know you've sometimes asked us about sort of co-benefits. What are the other things that help the city, even if they're not CPA per se? One is during the 1950s and 60s, that whole massive area off Ryan Road and Florence Road and Burst Pit Road were under construction. A lot of sort of post-World War II Veterans Home Administration homes were being built then. Um, it was an area prior to the Weapons Protection Act. And when the Weapons Protection Act passed, they basically got shut down, literally. They were, they were under construction, and Dick Carnes, one of your principal at JFK, shut them down, so you're failing wetlands. The result is some of the neighborhoods are divided. So if you live on Crestview, Ellington, or Sandy Hill, and you go to Ryan Road Elementary School, we're paying, I don't know, $160 a day for a bus to drive you around, even though if you walk through the conservation area, it's a really short distance. Um, and maybe we're still going to provide bus service. That's not something I get involved with out of the school department. But at least kids have another option to get there. And it ties different neighborhoods together. I mean, not not common scum issue per se, but it seems like it's straight. And, this, and, it, and um, uh, I, I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm sort of conflating two projects. So that, that's really more about the Bird's Bog <laughs> property than, than this one. But they sort of fit together and it's sort of thinking about handicap access. But sorry. Questions for Wayne about the accessibility project? Do you, do you want me to go through any of the specific sub pieces? I sort of think it's generally but it's useful to talk about. I think it would be helpful because I'm looking at the project budget and it, I'm assuming those are you're talking about, those, those yeah. sub pieces. And not seeing where these are or. Okay. Uh, so if you look at the, the 10 miles of bike paths that we built in the last couple of years, you're going to see that each street crossing, we have tactile warning, so that they're basically crosswalks. That wasn't part of the original 2.9 mile bike path. So the first thing I want to do is each of the crossings between State Street um, and Bridge Road, we want to, the area we want to bring off to ADA compliance is to put a, a concrete strip there and the tactile warning that's important for people who have visual um, impairments. And even, frankly, I think for a lot of us, it's not just visual impairments. It's you're, you're walking along, you feel the, the bumpity bumps, and that gives you a clear message for it. So, so that's one of the big items, is bringing the bike path up to compliance with ADA. Just in, when it was built 36 years ago, it just didn't have those things. So it'll look like the rest of the bike path. So that, that's, that's one of the big ticket items. The other thing is, we worked with a Chris Palermo, <laughs> if I remember his past, his last name, who's the head of the Committee of Disabilities, last year we did this project. And the Committee of Disabilities is really interesting in the things that are relatively low ticket items that provide more accessibility. And so one of the things that are interesting is, can we have benches, uh, can we have um, picnic tables that are wheelchair accessible? And basically a bench that's wheelchair accessible is, instead of the table ending at the bench, the table extends out where that distance is, two feet to three feet, so a wheelchair can go underneath it. By itself, they're not expensive. It's more expensive than you think because you have to put a concrete basin, you know, to, to hold them up. And we'd like to put those in all the recreation areas. Basically, all the areas of grass. We're not going to put it in the middle of a conservation area, but Connecticut River Greenway, uh, Shelton Field, Arcanum Field, et cetera. Um, and so again, that adds up. Um, and then the next big ticket item is um, <coughs> there's some root problems in the bike path that creates major gaps for some in a wheelchair, some with a cane, or you know anybody walking a trip over them. Um, they're far beyond maintenance type work, um, and so we're trying to address those as well. We have a different pool of money that we were awarded already, um, and so we know we're gonna do some of them, but we'd like to get all those things and bring in compliance. Um, and then the final one is really embarrassing, which you were incredibly generous for Pulaski Park, and two phases, three phases, whatever it was. Um, they did a really good job of handicap access, but unfortunately, a little embarrassingly, they have a water fountain that works for people and a water fountain that works for dogs. Um, and it's not wheelchair accessible and particularly embarrassing because we have one for dogs, but not for wheelchairs. And we'd like to fix that. Um, it's symbolically important. Um, and then related to that, we'd like to have a 
wheelchair or scooter charging station. We know that people who have electric wheelchairs and scooters are sometimes worried about the, the edge of their commute, right? Who wants to run out of electricity when you're far away? So we'd like to do that downtown. Um, probably that would be Classy Park. Frankly, we haven't talked to DPW. There are other parks downtown, so it could be a park by Union Station. Um, it could be a park in front of uh, First Churches. Um, but I guess it's going to be Classy Park. Um, <coughs> that's it, that's it. Any other questions? Thank you, Wayne. Okay. So last but not least, the first ball of my is true. So the final, and I'm sorry, when I was talking about the uh, accessibility, when I started talking about this one a little bit, and got confused for a second, so I apologize for that. But if you've seen, we've had this now for about 10 years, we had a master plan for what the build-out will be of all multi-use trails in town. And some were aggressively moving forward, and some we just want to know that Here's the plan so when opportunities come up. So we have this plan for what we call the Rocky Hill Greenway. Uh, so all the bike paths in town are along the railroad rights of way. And they're great, they serve 70% of the population, but they're located in part because that's where the railroad rights of way happened to be. Um, we just completed a week ago, extending the paved trail up to the Williamsburg town line with a separate grant, which you guys helped provide some matching money for, so thank you. We have a long-term plan to go along the Kennedy River into Hatfield. We can't move forward to that until MassDOT approves because it'll be a, a bike path along the active rail line and they've only been allowing that for three years, so it just sort of going through this slowly. But then a major cross-country one is we'd like to bring in the Ryan Road Elementary School neighborhood to be connected all the way downtown. So here we have this major population center, all those homes <laughs> I was talking about, that aren't connected, even though they're at the same density as Leeds and Bay State and Florence but they never had a historic river. So we're working on connecting there. We're doing a design right now between Route 10 and Route 66 that we're up to about 25% design, mass stop will build that. We bought this conservation area that goes from uh, Burstcote Road to Sandy Hill Road to Woods Road, um, and we'd like to connect that area. And it would have two purposes. Someday in the future, this is gonna be an, an orphan, frankly, for a while. Someday in the future, we'll connect all the way through downtown so it's part of this, our master plan for trails. But even if it doesn't happen for 10 years, it's the thing I'm saying, it's, it's a spectacular conservation area. It's the only bog we have in the city. You guys helped us fund this as well. Um, it connects three or four different streets that are sort of discontinuous now, so it brings them together. Um, and this is one of the areas, this is why I was getting confused, where we're doing ADA plus. So bike path by definition meets ADA standards, but again, you don't have benches, you don't have places to sit. If you don't have hard edges, you lose populations, right? So you need benches for people with mobility impairments. You need hard edges for people who have visual impairment abilities or, or challenges. And so we'd like to do both of those in, in this area. And part of it is to be ADA plus, but part is, you know, we've suddenly realized that the figure the state keeps talking about is we now have as a state more people who are over 60 than we have people who are under 20. And Northampton is even more true of that than the state as a whole. So it's not just people in wheelchairs, it's me. You know, it's a lot of people in, in, in my demographic who trip more often and want to fly and fly. So we think it serves all those purposes together and, and brings in this really cool area. And this one, we're also applying for a grant. We ha do not have this grant yet. We are reasonably certain we will get the grant. Um, so we think it's going to happen but we don't know that. And if we didn't get the grant, we wouldn't go forward and we wouldn't ask, we would not draw down your money. You will hear from this grant when? November is what we were told. So, so the issue is, um, this is a land and water conservation grant, which is a federal park service grant. In past years, including this time, they would tell the state how much money is available, the state would make recommendations because there were no more projects than money, they were always funded 100%. Land and water conservation is about to expire in the next two weeks. I don't know if this is from previous fiscal year and it's safe. I don't know if land and water is going to be refunded. So in a non-budget cutting year, I would have said we're absolutely going to be funded. I just, I don't trust, I'm never sure any of the federal level to have a sign contract. But November is what they told us, but again, dates could change as well. You know, particularly if Congress has to reauthorize something. Questions to Wayne? 
about the uh, Bayou's Trail? I was kind of surprised that um, the design portion was like almost a quarter of the budget. Is that typical? No. No, the, no, the usual rule of thumb, we, we like to say, and some of us who are older insist on saying this, that 10% is reasonable. Yeah. That hasn't been true for a while. So it's usually close to 15%. It's the reality. Permitting, this is the, because permitting. the term, the permitting is really what makes this site challenging. Yeah. Um, and it's, again, having gone through our due diligence, it's totally, do I should just say permanent. Permanent in design to address those permits. So we sort of know what those parameters are, um, but the design is just more complicated. So this, the state actually removed these turtles from the endangered species list. From, um, but I think we want, you know, we're in the conservation business. We're going to design this meeting the same standards we do. And so that's what makes them more difficult to sign, is the mitigation. And, and, and I also should add, and then the construction supervision during construction, which is part of the budget. That's in that design portion. That's in design portion, correct. Right. right. And that's often, when people talk about 10% or 12% or 14%, that often doesn't include construction administration. So the trail, um, you, you, those are one of my questions, it's, it's the quarters of a mile, and you are planning on putting benches along it. Correct. Not just at the trailheads. Correct. Okay. But we are, we are only planning to put interpretive signs to trailheads, just frankly, it's our experience, they get tagged more in the middle of the woods. Yeah, it clutters um, things up. Yeah, but benches are pretty easy. We, we have, the, like the Look Park bench, which we use in the Mill River, is actually a hard surface that we can sand, so if it does get tagged, we can fix it. So we're not that we're comfortable with that in the way. So there would be nodes along the way, so to speak. That's correct. Right. What work we using tag? Spray paint graffiti. Spray paint. Oh, yeah. Other questions? I just had one question on the uh, one of the cross sections. I just didn't know what HMA stood for. A uh hummus -huh, asphalt. Oh, okay. So Wayne, as you know, we're very stressed for money. We have somewhere around 800,000. This round proposal is coming at um, a little shy of 1.6 million, and the 800,000 is for both uh, both the fall and as well as the spring. Um, you've given us proposals which are somewhere around half of what we have spent, 400, you know, 300, and uh, close to 400,000 dollars. If you had to, if we had to prioritize, what would you suggest? So the, the handicap accessible money, which we think is an important project, potentially might be other sources. I mean, for the project down here, the mayor did go to council and ask for a late file capital improvement. So that would be the lowest priority um, project. Um, and it's potential, again, we pledged a 20% match. But if we get funded, we might be able to substitute in-kind services. So that would be the first one I would cut. Um, the uh, Parsons Brook, again, whether we get the state grant or not, is critical for us. So I would certainly say it's at the top of the priority. This one, likewise, obviously, if it's funded, we'd hate to turn back to $100,000, but I just don't know if it's going to be funded. Yet. On the accessibility one, how, how much flexibility do you have to slice and dice that if you want to lower the budget? Is that interfere with the grant if it's approved or? So it's a good question. Last year, because there weren't a lot of applicants, or because they love us, I'm not sure which, they gave us everything we asked for. Because we thought it would be more competitive <coughs> year, we specifically gave them scalable projects. Right, so last year you couldn't really do half the city hall. Right. So yes, the budget is totally oh, so scalable. They might, they might not give you the full That's amount. the issue, right. Oh. So, so the budget's totally scalable, but if they give us $250,000, I need to figure out how do I match that. But yes, they might well say, you know, we got a grant I can't announce yet because the state hasn't released it, but we asked for 250000 they're about to give us 225000 You know, they someone could do that. Kind of I, but you don't know whether they would tell you what projects those have. I'm sure they would not tell us. Would. I, don't, I think they leave that for local decisions. Okay. Um, and any project, the, the way I do grants that are bricks and mortar projects, you have to hold back at least 10%, if not more, for contingencies. Things happen, right? You, you get surprises. The way we tend to do it is, but on the other hand, I don't want to not spend every money of a state grant that I get. So the way we did this project, for example, is we had the simplest thing we could wait to the end to decide. The, the concrete sidewalk's actually along this building. We said, do everything else first. Let's know if we're going to need contingency, and then do that. 
that's typically how we do it. So, sure. and they've been that's the department of disability has been fine. But you know, yes, we we know you don't have it. You never get a front budget until you go to bed. Other questions for Wayne? Anne Marie, what were we going to ask Wayne? What was the question you said? Oh, we'll ask Wayne. That was like an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> do you remember what that was? There's something about the timing of the grant. The timing? The park grant. The timing of the park grant for the floor field. She needed the commitment. Right. right. So you need to have the commitment by the end of the calendar year. Um, so the, the grant application. So, so Anne Marie for that project already went to city council. So you probably know this. Every time we apply for a land grant or park grant, we go to city council up front, we get borrowing authority. So in theory, we could go bond it. But we get that by promising the city council we wouldn't spend a penny of it. So we could spin a grant application and say, look, we have all our money on hand, we have borrowing authority for all these grants or reimbursement grants. But we have a pledge to city council not to spend it, and every year we release the one from the year before. So we already have met the requirements that the land people have for funding. The issue is, if they announce in November, the mayor can't sign a contract until he has the money that funds the local piece. So the, the deadline is basically end of December, early January, when the mayor has to actually sign a contract and it comes through. Yeah, so. Thank you. And was it, and somebody want to know about the look park grant, why that wasn't funded? I don't know. Just we, no, okay. And that's even though I mean, the money that you approved wouldn't even be released until, I guess, the until yeah. those from the yeah. entire thing. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, folks in the viewing audience can stick around. We have a couple more small items to do up in the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for. And again, Wayne, as you know, our public, or as uh, I think Anne Maria the Gardner, um, our public comment date will be the first Wednesday in November, November the 7th. So if folks want to come and speak on these proposals, we would like them to do so on November the 7th. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a couple of other issues, I believe, quick ones. Um, before we end, the first is to schedule the site Saturday site uh, hike time uh, for it was going to be Boggs Meadow. Was that right? Uh, so people had indicated they were interested in going to the Birch Bog Trail and also to the Parsons Pine Bear. So that would be not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, the 13th. So it's Saturday the 13th. And we just need a time that would work best for folks. Oh, I, 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 I have it for 11 o'clock. Yeah. yeah. I lobbied for a little bit. We originally said 10, and I lobbied for 11. And then there's a show afterwards. That's right. Right. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> so 11 o'clock, and we are meeting where? I, I will follow up with an email. Okay. And they're right, really close to each other. There. Yeah. Okay, so 11, somewhere on Saturday the 13th, and your your talk is at two, two or is it three? <laughs> two. Two. Just check if it's worth my name from the website. I'm pretty sure it's two. Sarah, are those sites going to be wet? No. They, uh, we won't go to the wet. The wet. Okay. Um, the bog is mostly on the Ellington Road side, but mm -hmm. the trail is not for posting. Okay. Are high heels recommended? Yes. So the other thing we had talked about was um, uh, inviting the head of the oh, right, yeah. statewide. So we're I was going to propose that first Wednesday in December. I can't quite remember what the date is. Um, we theoretically would not be meeting then, but we may have business left. So if that's okay with folks. Um, I'd like to extend the in invitation to, uh, what's his name again? I'm blocking. Uh, Stuart Sagador. Stuart Sagador. For that first Wednesday, which is the what? The fifth. The fifth. Mm -hmm. Is that okay with folks? Yeah. Good. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Last but not least, um, 
we need to be looking at at the end of this um, this round the election of a, a new chair and new vice chair if those if the current chair and the current vice chair are not interested but even if they aren't still the people are so I think if folks are interested in <coughs> assuming those positions um, perhaps you could talk to Sarah in the next uh, few weeks and then we could we could move on to anyone want to you're willing to continue if, if <clears throat> we gave you a warm endorsement? I am willing to continue. However, if someone else wanted to do that, I would be certainly happy to step aside for someone. Would you be willing to continue as vice chair? Um, only under the same condition as before. That there's no expectation that I would fly <coughs> out to the chair. <coughs> So if folks are interested in just contacting Sarah, that will so uh, Somebody wants to get in line to be the chair, have to step aside. Um, so we would vote on that, Brian? And yes. The December I don't know, when, when will we vote? I think it may be at that last meeting. The December meeting, yeah. yeah. That make sense to do it. So for, for January. For, to be all set for June. You can make sure to fill out your campaign finance paperwork if you <laughs> Right. Yes, you'll see my ads appearing soon. Okay. Um, the last issue, Sarah, is there any movement on getting someone from planning? Is that still in flux? They, that is still in flux. They have a temporary chair at the moment, and they're down a couple members. So that probably will happen. So we will not have a new planning person this round? Yeah. Okay. A um, question, a planning question. Um, there was a meeting last night on <coughs> Main Street yeah. um, that I was not able to make it to. It's certainly, we yeah. don't know if you were there or not, but. I was not. Uh, uh, wait and wait for you to uh, ask. <laughs> is there anything uh, folks would like to share about the site visit that was is pertinent, or can that wait, or do you want that to wait until we discuss? Yeah. I have a, just a, I guess more of a, um, Questions so much about what is about the project, but um, the historical commission you know, supported this project because it's a historic uh, building, it's important, it's important to the history of the but it is privately owned and it's not open to the public. And so um, I, I just raise that as a question if you're members as to whether we want to have a discussion about that maybe the next, or you know, when we're deliberating on our funding. Very good point. Any other observations? <clears throat> I, being sensitive to the meeting rules, I, I would like to feel David out on what you thought about. The, I raised the question about the, the the structural engineers report, which I would like I would like to see. Um, and I want to get your feel for what you saw in the basement there. Yeah, actually, they, so Sarah, they, they said that they did a structural assessment of the building a couple of years ago when they were considering renovating it in lieu of some of buildings at the village hill um, and it was um, financially infeasible so they were relying i guess on that and the work of uh, um gross um, to assess where they needed to work on the existing brick um uh, yeah I, i'm a little concerned that their prioritization is not uh, done it the right, that's sort of a, a professional level. So I should add to a level that I wouldn't do myself for a project that I was working on. Um, that said, if we can ask them maybe before the, in the next, before the next meeting to see that structural report, I think that would be really helpful. Sure. Because maybe it's addressed. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions uh, you know, that I don't think that we can make any headway on tonight. Yeah, I'm just a little concerned about fixing the walls and the floor is going to fall through. Well, no, it's, you're fixing the high part of the wall, and the bottom of the uh, wall is going to fall out. Right? That's that's the problem. Um, I'm also I'm also questioning: is the point of this to have nicer looking brick on the outside of the building? I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little confused on what the project is. There's a lot of stuff that's listed in the application that's not historic. It's not right. No, not in the project even. I mean, they they mention things that aren't in the project, and I think a lot of this stuff they're going to do on their own. But they're just sort of talking about it. It's a mess of a building, so. 
just pour money into it for decades. Yeah. I wish that's been the case, I guess, in some case. So. I need to disclose my relationship with ServiceNet, as I mentioned a few weeks before when we were doing the, um, the Dial Self project, the Hampshire County Friends of the Homeless. Uh, my wife and I have this solar company, and we're doing some nonprofit stuff. We've done both, there's two ServiceNet King Street sites that are called the Castle, the Castle Wannabe next door. So, um, so again, in, talk, in my talk with the city solicitor, this does not represent a conflict of interest on my part. I just need to disclose it to Any other business not foreseen when the agenda came out? So we have uh, <clears throat> three proposals next time. We have uh, ServiceNet uh, Service site, Village Hill Apartments, and the uh, Ford Library. Um, so those are the three that we will see in two weeks. So a week from Saturday, we have a site visit, and then again, six o'clock before, <clears throat> excuse me, before uh, the next meeting, we will be at the library. Is that right? Yep. Just looking at the windows. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right.